My name is Becky Long. Uh, I live in Houston, Texas. Grew up in Oklahoma City and my dad was the serial killer, the Oklahoma City butcher, and I believe he killed Karina Saunders.
Wyoming on September 28th, 1979 in Oklahoma City to Linda and Daryl Long. Um, and I actually don't remember much of my childhood. Um, I have an older brother and he's 18 months older than me and he's always thrived in life. And I've always wondered why I've, I've struggled. Now I know we had very different childhoods. So I have three children and my first daughter was born in 2002, another daughter in 2008 and a son in 2010. And every time I was pregnant, I had very strange body symptoms that seemed to be related to the vagus nerve. Nobody could ever really figure out what was going on. I went to the emergency room several times as the pregnancies progressed, I seemed to get worse. Um, uh, now I know that those were body memories from the trauma and uh, I know a lot of women have are triggered when they're pregnant and, and, I, and that was what was going on with me. Within a few weeks of moving to Texas, I started having very strange body symptoms. I would, my heart would race, um, I would feel very nauseous and sick and I would pass out and wake up and throw up. And I was in and out of the emergency room multiple times, um, went to multiple doctors and nobody could figure out what was going on. It was a very scary time because we had just moved here and my children were young and I, I couldn't even care for my kids. And so eventually after a few months, um, the doctors decided to start taking organs out and so, um, you know, my gallbladder didn't look well on a CT scan so kind of assumed it was a gallbladder issue. So they removed my gallbladder, I was sick for a few more weeks and the symptoms went away. I assumed it was my gallbladder. Approximately four months later in the fall of that year, I went back to Oklahoma for a visit and I saw my dad that day. Um, I ended up in the ER that night with the exact same symptoms as when I moved to Texas. Now I know, um, and there was a, a part of me that knew my dad was very dangerous, but those memories were blocked. So after my gallbladder was removed, I started developing symptoms of PMDD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Because a um, week before my period, I was very sick and uh, a lot of times suicidal. On September 27th of 2017, my dad died of um, essentially drinking himself to death. This was the day before my birthday. My birthday is September 28th. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Karina went missing on September 28th. I will get to this later, but um, I believe my dad drank himself to death out of guilt for what he did to me as well as her and, uh, and the other girls. As soon as my dad died, I, I felt very disassociated. Very strange feeling as I had been a very hands-on mom for a long time. I, in fact, I homeschooled my kids. Um, up until this point, I was a very, very overprotective mother. Um, and now I know it's because essentially I had these very scary blocked memories and um, this is, it was a way of almost controlling my environment. around the time that I started developing very severe symptoms of PTSD. Um, and suddenly 
it was safe to put my kids in school again. I stopped homeschooling. I decided to go back to work. It was a very strange time. Um, it was almost as if the, my brain knew that the world was safe for my kids to go back to school and I could go back to work now because before that I could never put them in daycare. I couldn't leave them with anybody. I was just incredibly overprotective. This is when I start developing extremely severe PTSD symptoms. Um, it was brutal. It turned our lives upside down. <laughs> When people were agitated or irritated, um, it would trigger me. I was triggered very easily. Men triggered me very easily. Um, all I wanted to do was be alone most of the time because I just felt incapable of being around people because everybody always felt very unsafe. I spent my days trying to not get triggered and the energy it took to do that was just absolutely unbearable. I ended up moving out into an apartment. My husband and I have been married for 18 years at this point. 10 million suns across the sky won't outshine my love for you. It was a really, really hard time for everybody. I went and had a brain scan at the Amen Clinic. I still remember the doctor showing me the brain scan and saying I had PTSD um, and essentially I had the brain of a combat soldier. And in that moment, it was just this whirlwind of like, how did this happen? Um, what is this from? I didn't understand. I knew my dad was an alcoholic. My parents were divorced, but I never understood like what, what was so bad that I just, was this sick. Because at this point, I started having what I called collapse episodes. Uh, whenever I was triggered, essentially as if just my body collapsed. I just didn't function. I was tired. I could sleep for days um, and I didn't eat. It was just, I hardly even drank anything. I was not human for several days. And as time went on, these, these collapse episodes went longer and longer and I became very embarrassed because I did not understand why my body was doing this to me. So it, it just created more isolation and um, had more suicidal thoughts. Um, I held on for my kids. I realized my first collapse episode was actually um, when I went home after having my gallbladder removed and I saw my dad and ended up in the ER again. When I was driving back from Oklahoma, uh, I had my first collapse episode. I was so exhausted that I had to pull over. Thankfully, I had a friend in Dallas. I went to her house and um, 
my ex-husband, husband at the time, had to actually fly in and get me and my kids and drive us home because I, I, at the time I thought I had some sort of virus because I was just so exhausted. My symptoms escalated. I spent hours on the internet trying to figure out what was wrong with me. Um, I was desperate to figure out what was wrong with me. And at this time, life really began to unravel. My husband and I started going through a divorce. This is where I hit rock bottom. In December of 2021, I started having memories resurface um, of some other childhood trauma. Unfortunately, my childhood was hell and um, there was a lot of abuse that happened from a few different people. As the memories kept coming out, I kept thinking, this is why I'm, this is why I'm collapsing. This is it, this is why I'm collapsing. Well, memories came out, I'm still sick, I'm still triggered, I'm still collapsing. And um, God, I just felt so hopeless. The block memories of my dad were actually the last memories to come out. And so at this time, I'm still thinking that, um, you know, I've blocked everything. I'm still thinking that my dad, I took care of him when he was dying and sick and I had, no clue what he had done to me, no clue. I'm still really sick at this point. I decided to check into a 30-day trauma treatment program because I was not functioning and um, I knew I had to do something major or I wasn't going to make it. So before checking into the trauma treatment program, um, I had a friend who had been with me through all this. Um, she said, get on a plane, come see me for the weekend. And I was on the plane and um, I closed my eyes. I was really tired and started to doze off. And I had this memory hit me. Of, I was being held down and I was screaming for help. I remember is um, being given something pink to drink in a van and us driving for a while. I woke up, I was being held down, was being instrumentally raped. I remember it was blue, whatever it was. <laughs> And I saw my dad, he was standing off in the back. Um, and I was begging him for help. Um, and his face was stone cold and he was smoking a cigarette and he had a camera. I passed out. Um, I remember waking up naked on the floor and uh, I was so drugged. I, and sick, I couldn't turn my head and I started throwing up and I was choking on my own vomit and I could hear men talking and I, here I was just trash on the floor. You know, my whole life I've had panic attacks when whenever I'd throw up, I could never be alone. For some reason, I was actually very terrified of throwing up and now that puzzle piece made sense. They left me in a hot car and went in to wherever we got back the location we were at. And, and again, another one of my fears made sense. Had a lot of anxiety around hot cars. And so if it was hot outside, I'd already start the air conditioner before I could never get in. I, I just needed air. And had another memory of my dad calling me in or some man at our house. And um, my brother and I were playing in the backyard. There were some other friends there. And I remember my dad took me to um, his bedroom, my parents' bedroom. My dad worked nights and so he kept us during the day. So there was a lot of time for abuse um, during this time. And so I remember him shutting the door very coldly, taking, telling me to take my clothes off and I was raped. It photographed and 
I remember them telling me to put my clothes back on and went outside and I, I wanted to be a boy because um, in my mind, the things that were happening to me didn't happen to boys and they were, um, and I was essentially just trash, just there for whatever anybody wanted. I just knew my brother didn't have to go through what I went through and I associated that with him being a boy, which in my circumstance, that's exactly what it was. Around this time, I'm still having collapse episodes, but it's getting close to the time that uh, I was checking into the Sanctuary at Sedona 30-day trauma treatment program. And so I was taking my new puppy to my mom's house in Oklahoma so she could watch her while uh, I was away for 30 days. And as I was driving, I started having some memories hit me. At first there was a memory and it was my dad at a sink and he turned around and he had two knives and there was a table in front of him and a woman laying on the table. And I still remember her profile. She had high cheekbones and brown hair. Remember my dad sticking the knives into her as almost as if he was carving a, carving something. <laughs> I was gagged and tied up. Um, I remember we were in some sort of warehouse. He was able to pull the truck inside of the warehouse. And I remember there was windows up high, there was light coming in and my shoes were off to the left. And I just focused on my shoes because I didn't want to see what was going on. He was yelling at me, uh, wanting me to watch or it was almost as if he had so much anger projected at me, but he was taking it out on her. I remember him dragging her out of the back of the pickup. She only had one shoe on. I remember this moment where he turned her over and a lot of her was missing. And he was turning around and rinsing things off in the sink and there was red eyes chest with white lips next to him. He got very angry because I kept focusing on my shoes. <laughs> At some point he came over and he grabbed me by the hair and he actually cut my hair um, with the knife. At this point, I defecated on myself. I remember being very afraid because I was also trying to throw up because I was gagged, but nothing could come out. So again, I was choking on my own vomit. Um, I saw him cut her hair. I remember him cleaning up and squirting, squirting me down like I was an animal um, and seeing um, her hair, my hair, blood on the floor. Um, I googled my memories. Um, I found that there was a serial killer that targeted American Indian women in Oklahoma City and they called them the Oklahoma City Butcher. And my memories matched the murder of Marcia Tina Sanders. So I knew my dad cut up a woman and I Googled it and there it is. I had no idea Oklahoma City had a serial killer. I had never heard of the Oklahoma City butcher. Um, I don't remember exactly what I Googled, but I remember um, it was the unresolved murders website, Oklahoma City butcher. And as I'm reading through this, I'm, no, 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 no. My dad worked at the Wonder Bread plant in downtown Oklahoma City for a while. I 
felt like the murder was at the Wonder Bread plant and I wasn't sure how that was possible because I assumed it was open 24 hours. When I Googled, uh, the Wonder Bread plant shut down in February of 1986 and the murder of Marsha Tina Sanders was in March of 1986. I believe my dad knew the ins and outs of the building and it was vacant at this point and that is where um, he cut up Marsha Tina Sanders. When he was finished, um, he wouldn't even let me ride in the front cab of the pickup truck. I remember riding in the back of a pickup with these ice chests, knowing there was body parts in them. Uh, we went to pick up my brother. This time I was in half day kindergarten. I went to afternoon kindergarten. Um, I remember him pulling over before we got to Grace Christian Academy, which is where we went to school for a few years. And I was told to get in the front cab of the pickup truck. And, um, and this is another memory of my brother we were picking up my brother and he was so happy coming out of school. And God, I just wanted to be a boy again. I knew my dad hated me for some reason. I didn't understand why. This is where I start putting a lot of puzzle pieces together. So um, I know what I saw matched up to Marcia Tina Sanders. There's no other murder in Oklahoma where there's American Indian that was cut up into pieces. I knew my dad at this point was the Oklahoma City butcher. My dad collected knives. Uh, so I'm starting to put all this together. He was in the army, he was a chef in the army. Um, in the 70s, I have some of them and my brother has the majority of them. After he died, we inherited those. My dad was obsessed with cleanliness and bleach. Um, so I know most likely they were cleaned, but they're in a Ziploc baggie just in case. She disappeared on my birthday, September 28th. I read the autopsy of Karina and there are body parts missing, just like the Oklahoma City Butcher victims. She had her hair cut, just like the Oklahoma City Butcher victims. And as far as I know, nobody has connected her murder to the murders of the Oklahoma City butcher victims. Um, I, I realized they were all connected as I'm researching everything. At this point, I was so sick. <laughs> so overwhelmed, I just didn't want to live anymore. And I don't believe I went through all that to sit around and hide away. Uh, I want to help bring closure to the victims' families. There's been a 15,000% increase in child sex abuse material in the last 15 years. And I had no clue that child porn was violent until my memories resurfaced. I was naive and assumed it was pictures of children naked. I had no clue violence was also involved.
there are little girls, boys right now that are violently raped like I was, having to go to kindergarten the next day and pretend like everything's okay. So I'm gonna fight for them. I'm hoping is getting my story out. Maybe somebody saw something. My dad was at the Taco Bell, um, where Karina was at all the time. He lived at Northwest Tenth and Council, shopped at the Homeland at Northwest 23rd and Rockwell. This was his area. Did somebody see something? Did somebody hear something at Thousand Oaks? like to put the puzzle pieces together to bring closure to Karina's family. a licensed professional. Do you understand and agree? I do, yes. Perfect. All right, love. What questions do you have? Actually, before you ask me anything, I, I will mention this. Um, I don't know if this is this year or next year. I'm kind of leaning towards this being like in a couple of years. If you have an opportunity to participate in a project that's media-based or, or, or media uh, connected or possibly even a documentary, um, even if it's just like a, a two-minute clip, um, I would say do it because it might be some fun and you might connect with some interesting people. Okay. Yeah, because what I kept seeing, what I kept seeing, I kept seeing two things. I kept seeing sometimes when you like I've watched like some of these documentaries on Netflix or like Unsolved Mysteries or whatever. So you'll see like these interviews and people giving interviews of their story or experiences or something that they're going through. So I was seeing that, but then I was also seeing um, like Lisa Ling when she was traveling across the country and she was asking into uh, asking questions or getting to know people and some things that were going on in different parts of the country. So I was seeing all of that in my head and I was like, okay, there's something media based here that's going to come up for you. Maybe within a two, two year period. So I would say do it because it might actually be a, a good thing for you. Okay. Uh -huh. 
there was also a murder in 2011 um, that is very similar circumstances. And the parents are trying to find out who the murderer was. There's actually somebody that's been wrongly accused. And I feel like it was my dad. And I'm so so the reason why I brought up the unsolved mysteries thing, um, I had a client who had a mediumship session with me. And in the session, her mother came through who had been killed. Um, and her mother um, had been raped and murdered. Um, and she was actually featured in an Unsolved Mysteries episode. And her father was a serial killer. So that was the exact thing I was remembering when I was telling you about this Unsolved Mysteries thing, or if you get a chance to participate or give a, 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 an interview, it would be good for you. So I don't feel like what you're experiencing is made up. I think there's definitely some truth to what you're experiencing it. And I think that as time progresses, more of the details are going to come out and it may match up to facts precisely. So I feel like you're onto something that's going to start to kind of unravel and show up in a much bigger way. And this may be an opportunity for you to bring closure to a lot of people's lives. Here's the thing, you know, we are not always, you know, light comes through dark, dark, dark comes through light. And sometimes darkness comes into this reality because there are opportunities for us as humans to kind of learn from those engagements with that level of darkness. But there's also light in the world. And so even if you came through something that was dark, you're the light mm -hmm. and you get to heal or provide closure to people in their lives. And so I think what you're doing and what's happening now isn't just a journey about you. It's a journey about those others who need to be healed in the process.